Are you sitting comfortably? Uh, hoi hoi folks and welcome to today's video where we're doing something slightly different today. So for those of you that don't know, I used to be a teacher, I was a teacher for a very long time and uh, I get lots of requests for lessons and tutorials and things like that. So I thought I would actually do a proper lesson today. So um, it's going to be nice and relaxed, I'm just going to talk you through the subject but before I do that, I know Finnegan has something that he wants to say to you. Hello everyone, Finn here, Puppet Social Media Manager extraordinaire. Did you know we're trying to get 10,000 subscribers on this channel? I found out today only 90% of you are subscribed. <sighs> we can do better. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Hit the notifications. Don't miss videos in the future. Join the frog face family. Until next time. Goodbye. Thanks for that Finnegan. Um, now let's get on to the lesson. So this is Art Reference Images 101. Now, how many of you have heard this? Using reference is cheating. It's just not true, I'm sorry, but reference has always been used by artists. Reference can be a whole bunch of things. It might be a still life setup, life models, preliminary sketches that you've made before, photos, there's lots of things that count as reference. And they're a fundamental and very important part of creating artwork. So, why do we use reference? Well, reference gives us something more than just our imagination to construct images from. Our brains and memories are not 100% accurate. We can learn art fundamentals and construct finishing pieces. So what I mean by that is, it's all very well drawing from imagination and painting from imagination, but there has to be some basis in reality. And the way we do that is by studying real life, and we use reference to do that. Our brains are fallible. You know, we do forget things. We're not going to hold on to every piece of information, particularly when we're talking about a lot of visual information. So we use reference so that we can learn and grow from there and actually for constructing completed finished pieces as well. Okay, so a lot of you will be familiar with this. This is a Pinterest board uh, and I'm gonna go through how to use reference effectively. Okay, so the first thing is to be intentional. Don't get distracted by all the different images. I know what it's like, I do it myself, I sit there in the evening, I go onto Pinterest or any of the other image sites and I flick through and I go, I like that, I like that, I like that. And, and I'm not really focusing on anything in particular, I'm just saving lots of different images, which is fine, but if you are doing something specific, then you should be looking for specific images and actually when we're searching for images we should be targeting what we're doing as well so i've got here instead of searching for faces try searching for angry expressions or for a specific artist like da vinci or dali or anyone else make boards and collections of images based on a subject that you are wanting to work on you can even make sub boards within those boards so that you can collate even more so for instance if you're working on da vinci and you want to look at all of his sketches and his painting you can have those in two separate boards on pinterest okay so cfc these are the three things i look for in a good reference and i i'm specifying good reference here because there is such a thing as bad reference uh, but CFC it's not chlorofluorocarbons we're not in uh, chemistry today these are my three go-to things and they are contrast so the light and shadow in the piece flow so the movement line of action that kind of thing and composition the placement of the individual elements within the piece okay so 
let's start with contrast, the light and shade of it all. So this is a subject most of you will be familiar with, but it does bear repeating. Light and shadow dictate the forms of an object, whether that's a person, an animal, or a landscape. Light and shadow tell us exactly what that thing is in three-dimensional space. Well, why is that important? It's important for so many reasons, but when we're trying to create a sense of reality, we need to feel that piece within the real world or within the world that you've created and whatever the rules of that world are but they will have a basis in reality and knowing form and shape is kind of a fundamental art thing and there are lots of different exercises you can do for this but as an example we're going to take a simple rectangle so imagine this rectangle is a 3d object but the light is shining directly at it. So from the perspective that you are looking at it, that's where the light is shining. All you would see is the outline of that shape, of that rectangle. You're not gonna get any more information than that. But actually there is a lot more to shape and form than simply lines. So for instance, if we have the light shining from this direction, then we'll end up with this. So this is the box casting a shadow into the space that it occupies. The reason it's important to study these kinds of things is actually this is not the only way this light could work. For instance, if that was an inset rather than an extrusion, you're going to be looking into the hole that that shape has made rather than the shape sticking out from the surface. This is why it's important to have that contrast between the light and the dark, the light and the shadow. So the same thing with the rectangles applies to reference images. Avoid direct lighting and instead look for interesting shadows. I'm going to show you this in the form of portrait pictures. Okay, so here are some images that have poor lighting. So as you look at all of these, you'll see that the lighting is flat and straight on. It lacks contrast between the light and the shadow, and there's actually minimal shadow shapes. And I'll show you what I mean by shadow shapes in just a minute, but they overall look very flat. And if you try to draw this, you're probably gonna end up with just outline drawing and not much else. Here's an example of good lighting. So all of these have a clear directional lighting. There's really good contrast between the light and the shadow and really clearly defined shadow shapes. I mean, you get a real sense of the volume of those heads there, where the other ones could be cardboard cutouts. So let's take a closer look at what I mean by shadow shapes. This is one of the images from the good reference section on the last slide. And from here, you can see that these sections that I've colored in, in blue are really clearly defined shadows on the face. Likewise, there's also some very clearly defined light sections as well. If you think about these two together, the light and the shade, you can really see how you can construct an image of your own, not necessarily this person, but use the information from this reference image to create your own image using that same information. Okay, so flow, movement in the image. So this is difficult because actually flow and composition are quite intricately linked and a couple of these could fall in either category, but I don't mean physical movement from one place to another. Instead, I'm thinking about things like the line of action, the angle of the image, what is it that's guiding your eye through the image? And of course, perspective. There's so much more that we think about, but I think a really good way to visualize it is actually with an example. So I'm sorry if you don't like reptiles, but I'm gonna use a crocodile for this. So here we have two images of a crocodile. If we're thinking about line of action, motion, movement for these pieces, both of them have very good and very clear line of action. If we take the slide on the left and look at the crocodile, you can see very clearly from the head that kind of serpentine line that comes up and around to the tail. We know that as that crocodile is going through, it's going to be making these undulating 
movements and you can kind of interpret that you know this for instance might be a dragon flying in the air um, but you can use the information there and transpose it onto to other things similarly the one on the right we are not only getting that sense of movement and spiraling but we're also getting quite a nice composition as well with that tail coming up and really framing the crocodile at the bottom again I'm not saying that we're going to copy this image exactly, but there's a lot of information in here that we can take and transpose into other images. So when we're talking about flow, we're really talking about how can we exaggerate and pull out the movement that's already there, the shapes that are already there, and use them to our advantage. And then the third part of CFC, composition, placement of the elements. So there are lots of guides to compositional ideals such as golden ratio, rule of thirds, all that kind of stuff. If you do a quick YouTube search or just Google search, you will find lots of information out there. So what I like to do is use reference of old masters, film stills, animation stills. They can all give really good reference to these rules and how you might want to lay out your own work. In fact, movies and animation are excellent for this because directors spend their whole life learning about composition so that they can make it the most appealing thing for you to be watching. So I'm going to show you two images. One is an example of what I would consider okay composition. So let's have a look at that one first. So this is a landscape and you can see we've got our horizon line is pretty low. There's good perspective on the clouds, there's that element of detail with that tree line and we've also got some hedges and bushes at the very front as well. It's not bad, it would make an interesting painting. However, if we go ahead and look at this one, this is better composition, it's essentially the same thing. We've got a sky, we've got a tree line, we've got a field, but there are a few key elements on this which make it a better composition. That is the placement of the building, first of all, which is in one of those third quadrant. We have this winding path going through as well. And the tree line is broken up too, with some of those trees being a lot further forward than the others. Now, again, I'm not saying that this is something that could be copied, although there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't go ahead and use this as a painting study. But by thinking about it in the terms of composition and what could be taken away from it, then suddenly you can see that that pathway could in fact be a cobblestone road, or it could be a river, it could be a strip of sand next to a beach. The building that's there, it looks maybe like a religious building, it could be a different kind of church, you could put a castle there, it could be a small cliff or a dragon or anything. But the compositional aspects of this picture are more pleasing than the one on the left. So here's a few important things to remember. Be intentional with your references. Like I said, it's very easy to get stuck into, into that thing of just scrolling through and saving lots of reference pictures, but no, be intentional with it. If you're studying landscapes, look at landscapes. If you're studying wildlife, look at wildlife. If you wanna know how an elephant's trunk works, then search for an elephant's trunk and not just an elephant. So here's an important one. Make sure the owner of the images is okay with you using the image as reference. So. If you're using Instagram, for instance, uh, a lot of photographers on there will have in their bio or on their website whether it's okay for you to use their reference images. In fact, some of them will even repost artwork that has been made using their reference images. So it's always really good to check that. Of course, remember the CFC, that's contrast, float and composition. Don't be afraid to mix references. As I said before with the crocodile, you know, that crocodile could be anything. If I wanted to draw a dragon, I might have one of those crocodile pictures up as my movement. I might have another image up as my background or a few images up that I can draw from. And then I might have eight, nine, ten different dragon images that I can pick little bits from and smash them together or interpret them in my own way. So don't be afraid to kind of be a bit of a magpie, gather it all together and use it as you will. These next two go together and it goes without saying. Copying someone else's artwork and passing it off as your own is not okay. It's just not. 
don't do it, it's not cool, no one likes it. However, copying someone else's work in a personal sketchbook and learning from them, that is fine. That is all part of learning. We all do it, we study the masters, we study artwork that we like, that is absolutely fine. Just make sure you are not telling people that it is your own artwork and you're passing it off as your own. And then finally, the most important thing to remember, have fun. Anyway guys, we are going to leave it there for today. Um, if you've liked this style of video, then leave a comment down below. Uh, tell me what you think. I've really actually enjoyed making this. It's taken me back to being in a classroom and, and giving lectures and, and study halls. So I have actually quite enjoyed this. There's lots of other topics I would be happy to chat about. It's kind of an extended version of my Tuesday top tips, my little shorts that I have. And if you've got anything that you'd like me to teach or you'd like tutorials on, again, leave a comment down below. I do read all of the comments and I do reply to them as well. This whole PowerPoint presentation is actually going to be available to download for my Patreon, so I'm going to put it up on Patreon for them as an exclusive so they can use it as reference whenever they like. But as always, I really hope you've enjoyed today's video, and until next time, goodbye.